Welcome to Cassette Connection, the podcast where we discuss music and meaning with the people who make it. My name is Ben, and with me is Alex. In this episode, Ben speaks to Dr. Alexander Hunter. Alec is a composer and academic who is currently lecturing composition at the ANU School of Music. Alec is a bass player, but also plays a wide variety of instruments, including the viola da gamba. Alec discusses his academic career and how he has developed his style of composition. We talk about his specific approach to open scoring and allowing the performer space to insert their own voice within a piece. We talk about the importance of free improvisation and how it relates to his practice, as well as the conceptual ideas that are expressed within his music. We also touch on his experience with Scottish music, uh, Scottish folk music, light music and classical music. Enjoy. My name is Alec Hunter. I'm a composer and double bassist um, based in Canberra. And I'm currently lecturing at the ANU School of Music. I teach composition and theory. Um, Before I got to Canberra, I was a poor student living in Glasgow and um, attempting to make a living as a session musician. playing on mainly like folk and bluegrass records and also playing trumpet in some kind of twee indie pop bands, um, which yeah was super fun. Um, so I was, it uh, sounds a bit like, I don't remember the movie, but that, that bit where Steve Martin says, I was born a poor black child, um, which I was not but I was born uh, in uh, a really small village in Northeastern Ohio, uh, kind of on the edge of Amish country. And my parents are both from Chicago. And um, yeah, I moved there for work and got really kind of stir crazy because we're, yeah, not um, not little village, not little village people, yeah. so when I was like four, we moved back to Chicago. I lived in the suburbs, kind of the, the last commuter train stop um, out of uh, downtown Chicago. And yeah, I had kind of a normal public school, middle class education, um, started taking piano lessons when I was like 10 and hated it and was really bad at it. And then started playing trumpet in school, which was um, much easier. You only have to kind of worry about one note at a time. Um, and then that was kind of the, that was in the nineties and there was this sort of weird boom in, um, my school district, which is the largest school district in the state of Illinois. Um, and they built in the local high school, this huge performing arts center and basically invented a high school to go alongside the normal one called the the Visual and Performing Arts Academy. I kind of hit a wall in my trumpet playing and it's kind of competitive and like it, it sort of makes you into a worse person than you were before you started playing the trumpet or at least high school like competitive stuff did. So I started getting into um, kind of leftist politics and going to a lot of punk shows, this big hardcore punk scene in my suburb. So I started playing bass in a punk band. Um, the big band director found out that I played bass and basically at the end of one of the semesters, at the end of my first year of high school said, look, if I give you a double bass, if you, if you borrow a double bass from the high school over the summer, here's a book, it's a transcription of Rufus Reed bass lines teach yourself how to play, come back and be the bass player in the big band. So I, with like my spiky hair and Jenko jeans and like stupid chain wallet and black fingernails was like sitting in my basement all summer, wood shedding and trying to figure out how the hell to play double bass. Um, And this was before YouTube existed and the internet or whatever. So I had like the worst technique on the planet. Um, But eventually changed my focus to double bass. um, And I went to uni in um in illinois at 
Northern Illinois University, which is a big jazz school. Um, studied jazz education for a while, then kind of got similarly um, disenchanted, I guess, with the way that music education is run at a big um, state school and kind of dropped out of the music school, entered the Bachelor of Arts, did anthropology and music, studied composition. And during this whole time, I'm also kind of running the experimental music um, like the student ensemble and we're doing weird site-specific concerts and climbing up ladders and playing weird flutes at people and doing Frederick Jeffsky pieces where we throw things at drum kits and like, you know, pretty standard experimental music education. Um, yeah. So I finally finished my undergraduate after four years, which is standard, but I, I took some summer school courses to get the hell out of there. Uh, as quick as I could. Um, and to kind of decompress, I moved to the Isle of South Uist, which is um, about eight hours off the coast of Scotland. I lived there for a year. I did a, a locally run course on Gaelic music and language, uh, worked in a recording studio, got some work recording bagpipe concerts um and then after a year living in a like stone house with a thatched roof on the beach on a super remote island through the winter where like basically the sun sort of just doesn't come up i mean on the flip side in the or the in the winter yeah summer um you can read a book at like two o'clock in the morning outside which is pretty spectacular um i moved i Packed all of my stuff in my little um, Ford Escort, drove down to the big city, found an apartment on that day, moved in. I lived in a little one bedroom in Leith, which is the neighborhood in which train spotting was set, uh, although it's been pretty, pretty substantially gentrified since then. moved down i had come down previously and interviewed for a phd in composition um and was accepted in that interview so i kind of got my got my things together put everything i owned in my little ford escort drove down moved in and yeah started studying composition um more formally uh that was 2007. Um, i lived in edinburgh for a few years um, moved to Glasgow a few years after that, um, after like a weird six months in Seattle. Um, and yeah, w while I was in Glasgow, I worked as an English teacher, um, speakers of other languages, and also um, taught at a pop music TAFE. Um, I'm teaching pop music history and theory and um, directing um, rock bands and, and stuff like that while I was finishing my PhD, which was on kind of open music and um, different forms of communication between performers. Um, yeah, kind of spectral informed sonic material, really kind of um, trying to integrate anarchist politics into lots of different musical um, parameters within, um, within pieces. And then I, there, it used to be in the UK that you would um, finish uh, someone with a non-EU passport, because I only have an American passport. You do a PhD in the UK, and they give you two years after you finish to kind of hang out and find a job. You know, we've invested all this time and money in your education. Please stay. And while I was finishing, the Tories came into power um, and changed that two years to three months. So I slightly dawdled perhaps on finishing my phd corrections and um was just applying for random jobs including a job in a weird place called canberra which i'd never heard of and probably didn't know what the capital of australia was before i moved down here which is both hilarious and embarrassing um and yeah i got an interview like the date maybe a couple of days before christmas and I was set to be deported 
uh, in March of 2014. So I moved here in February. So a month before uh, the UK was going to send me packing. So, uh, yeah, it's been weird. But, yeah, very a fun and, and varied educational experience, I guess. The ways in which I engaged with the punk scene um, are sort of, it's not quite like in, um, you know, you occasionally show the documentary, The Decline of Western Civilization with like the germs, you know, like a this super um, kind of gritty LA punk from the, the early nineties, like Black Flag and these sorts of things. But um, because I was in high school, uh, and for part of that, I did not have a car um, and also was too young to drive anything. Um, we were kind of, yeah, growing up in, in Chicago at that time, being interested in that sort of music, there are like the records that you buy. Um, and, you know, at that time, even in the pop punk scene, like Alkaline Trio were big and they were from my suburb. Um, like they went to the, the Christian school, which was kind of funny. Um, but it was less because I was too young to go to um, the kind of bigger shows. Like, I mean, I saw, you know, when bad religion would come to town or something like that, my parents would take me. Um, and I, yeah, like went to a big festival and saw Blondie and Puya and all of that, you know, like when I was 15, but the, the main way in which I engaged with the scene was to, just go to shows. So the, the majority of, um, I guess both the punk music that I engaged with and the, the ways in which I engaged with the scene in the mid to late nineties. Um, and then early into the kind of early two thousands, although by the time I was kind of thinking about uni, I was maybe listening to less punk and more getting really deeply into jazz. Um, which, yeah, I guess is an is an overlap I haven't thought too much about, but um, I guess would would be interesting at some point to to think about. But um, yeah, like multiple nights a week, there were basement shows. You know, in in um, Chicago and in the suburbs, we have lots of basements, and there's always you know some of the bigger bands, and also if you form a band, you can kind of get a spot on these shows where there'd be like you know ten bands, everybody plays like a twenty minute set everybody's in a sweaty basement and people are kind of moshing in the middle and you can sort of be the 15 year olds standing at the back, not getting punched in the face. Um, and ever, you know, this is when like CDRs were big. So everybody would like just burn heaps of CDRs of their weird demo. And we had like in my parents' basement, really like the worst, microphones possible like hanging from the ceiling above the drum kit with my like task cam four track so it was less about i guess going to big shows um you know going to concerts and buying records and more about we didn't really think about the fact that we were just doing it ourselves it's just like there was this the scene that i kind of grew up thinking was normal was the one where everybody's in a couple of bands and everybody has a Tascam 4 track and everybody has a bunch of really shitty microphones that like are covered in lipstick and the you know screen is all dented and um, the quality is just horrendous and you know you kind of everybody scrimps together and buys the worst PA you can buy at Guitar Center. Um, yeah and you kind of buy those little CD labels and, or just write on it with a Sharpie was a big way that, that we used to do that. And, you know, yeah, kind of seeing the scene as this holistic um, communal thing where everybody's actually making the music and also going to shows and listening to records. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty, I guess, immersive experience for a, for a young person. 
in a way, um, from from what you've also mentioned about um, the kind of anarchist approach to composition and um, music direction and ensemble performance and that kind of stuff, do you think that you kind of gaining a, a sense of that influence from those early years and then kind of what you were were doing in in later uh, education? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the context of that DIY culture, looking at like the composers collective that I used to run in Edinburgh, which was, I mean, we had some, you know, we were PhD students or undergraduates um, or some of the professors um, and even the head of school. And we would like, you know, hire for like, I don't know, like 40 bucks or 75 well, it was pounds, but whatever, like just basically find a church, bring all of the audio gear that we have, and then just have like four kind of independent um, solo electroacoustic or electronic composers do stuff. We'd hire our friends to do the graphic design. Um, and yeah, I think that from that early experience of if you want to engage in a scene, you have to be able to do all of this stuff that I've never operated under the assumption that like I'm a composer. That means that what I do is this particular thing. Like I sit here with my software or my piece of paper, I write stuff and then I give it to you, but that I have to be able to make the music and I have to be able to organize the concert and um, make the recordings and do all of this stuff. And I think, yeah, the kinds of activities that I was doing when I was 15 with my little punk bands and then through subsequent kind of composer collectives and even the kind of student run organizations um, at ANU, you know, Experimental Music Studio, that's the same kinds of activities. I guess just sometimes the music sounds a bit different. I guess from a composition standpoint, like I, when I was at this like junior conservatorium performing arts academy thing, I was playing like orchestral repertoire and I was playing solo cornet stuff and I played double bass. And also I was playing all this um, punk music and getting into funk and like, you know, Rage Against the Machine was really big at the time. And for a young bass player like that, plus Jaco Pastorius, plus like Rocco Prestia. Like, yeah, it was fantastic. But it's all with maybe the exception of the punk stuff, which conceptually, I think for me at the time was quite a separate practice. Um, it's all relatively conservative. Like there are uh, like performance models that you're operating under and like, this is what the thing is, and this is the repertoire. And I remember being quite musically conservative in the, in the context of like the classical stuff that I was playing, the solo repertoire that I was playing, um, which is just the vibe that, um, of like high school, you know, like you study tonal music. I have like theory and oral skills classes and we had conducting class and all of this stuff that like, the fact that John Cage exists, he's like this weird devil in the corner. And then I got to uni and my first composition teacher, David Mackey, um, who's still teaching at, at Northern Illinois. Um, like one of the first things he did, you know, you have your first meeting, you sit down, right, what kind of stuff are you into? What have you composed? Well, I, I write a lot of like funky big band stuff. You know, I write, I don't really write songs, you know, lyrics don't really work for me, but I, you know, writing guitar parts and things like that for my, my punk bands. And um, it's like, look, here's a book. I want you to, and we kind of talked about politics and all of, all of these sorts of things. Like I remember even in year seven, my lunch table formed an independent communist collective and we would like draw little hammers and sickles and all this. So it's, all, it's all, always kind of been in there. I authority and, and I don't really get along particularly well. So 
so we're having all these conversations. He said, look, here's a book. And I went home and I read this thing. This was John Cage's Silence. And like all of these ideas, like, shit, I can write music where like my ideas of authority and autonomy and people being able to do stuff for themselves and not bossing people around and all of this stuff has a place in uh, my kind of chamber music practice, my academic music practice and all of this. So from then, like I, the first piece that I wrote as an undergraduate was for double bass and vibraphone. It's an open score. It's got like note heads and just kind of rough instructions for each of the sections. And it's really kind of open. So this, the idea that comes from Cage, a lot of it comes from Cage. Um, but um, you know, not, uh, yeah, a lot of things. One, like I don't want the piece or I don't need the piece to be the same every time. Um, and I also don't, always feel like I know the best um, way to do something or that the, if I'm kind of also empathizing with performers and thinking about all of the like, you know, concerts from high school when I played the trumpet and, you know, I played the trumpet solo in um, Ravel's orchestration of Mussorgsky's picture, pictures in an exhibition, you know, bum, 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 bum. And I remember playing that at like the Capitol building in Madison, Wisconsin, and I cracked one of the notes and I was like, fuck, like hundreds of people just heard me crack that note. What am I doing? Like this, the idea that your music can be delicate in ways that don't involve stress for performers and don't involve them trying to achieve something that you've set out there. I said, here's this kind of difficult thing. I need you to do exactly this. Trust me, it'll be great. And maybe it is great, but that means that they're trying to do something that you've set out. Whereas the ways that I started composing music based on all the kind of letting all of this politics come in through this door that was opened by Cage's writings means that the music is delicate in different ways and it's more kind of similar to just kind of passively listening to things and letting sounds happen and giving sounds this sort of space so it's still delicate but it's not like nervously delicate one of the the biggest takeaways and and lessons that I've learned uh, from you through the lecturing process and and just learning through uh, composition is the um, is the the open approach to composition and giving the the player the active role um, in shaping uh, how the piece is being performed and and it's like you said like the piece doesn't need to be the same every single time um, and I think uh, one of the big things is like, you know, I'm not a cello player. Uh, I don't know, like I can theorize about what the best way to play the cello is, but I don't know that for a fact. So perhaps the person who has the hands-on experience with the instrument might know the approach to the notes that you're trying to put out. Yeah, I think... In addition to the fact that like as composers and now that I'm, I've been in a situation for a a few years now where I'm teaching um, this kind of weird combination of mainly first years and also like master's, PhD, honors students. So I kind of, there's a weird well in the middle, um, which has been kind of interesting. But I think this idea that, um, yeah, we're, trying to negotiate a couple of things and one is this idea that you as a composer your job is to learn as much as you can about all of the different objects that you want to use in which uh, 
you want to use to make sounds. You want to write a cello piece? Okay, you need to know as learn as much as you possibly can about what's possible on a cello, how it works, um, you know, physically what's involved in making sounds. You know, is that how large is a human hand related to this thing? How what stuff works on a viola but not on a cello? How are things notated? How do performers think? What do they like to play? What do they not like to play? There's all of this sort of research so that you can write a piece that um, works well on the cello, however you define working well, and that cellists are interested and excited in playing. It doesn't look like you just gave me a flute part that you put down an octave or whatever. Um, negotiating that with this other perspective that you're talking about, which is giving a cellist a space to, and kind of acknowledging the fact that they're the expert. I'm, I'm an expert in particular things. You're an expert on doing stuff with a cello. But I think the the way to kind of combine those two things is to use your composition to create spaces where this person who has uh, particular expertise on their instrument you know, these are the things I know how to do. I can play the Elgar like nobody's business or or whatever it happens to be. That you use your knowledge of the organization of sound and all of these kind of philosophical things and also how string instruments work to create spaces where they can experiment and explore and new and learn new things about their relationship with their instrument. pieces, especially the pieces that I wrote um, while I was living in Edinburgh and Glasgow, are this combination of really open, you know, here are a bunch of uh, kind of instructions for sound production, do them in whatever order you like, or, you know, interact with these other musicians in these kind of open ways, or choose these options or whatever. But that the individual sounds are really specific, you know, I'm notate exactly where you're where i'm suggesting that your hand go and exactly the pressure and all of these things so that you're in the context of having all of this autonomy and space in which to kind of co-create you're also encouraged to think about what well, shit well you know i don't often consciously think this much and this um kind of singularly about the weight of my bow hand you know, yeah, I, th I think about it all the time and I th think about it more or less consciously depending on the repertoire that I'm playing. But to say for the next 30 seconds, the only thing I have to think about is adjusting the weight of my bow hand. And I think the one thing that's come out of um, it's something that was kind of in the works before I moved to Canberra, but but then when I moved to Canberra, like I had been in a kind of musical community in Scotland and also um, colleagues of mine in England and on the continent, and whatever, and I've maintained co contact with people that I went to uni with um, in Chicago that you know i'm working with performers i have you know when you're writing a piece of music you always have some kind of more or less fuzzy like perfect version of the piece and i'm trying to you know use whatever tools i have to get it out there so that it can do something so i can hear it and maybe so that other people can also hear it maybe so other people can play it but i just want to hear this thing you know i'm providing some kind of instructions for a sonic experience that doesn't that I don't have access to yet. And when you build these kinds of spaces where people can put their own stuff into it, occasionally, as much as you try to hold on to your philosophical um, ideals, sometimes you build a space and people do stuff in it that you're not that happy with. 
And there's that quote, which is, I think, from Christian Wolf, um, which is, you know, whenever you're writing notation, always think about what the worst possible way a performer can faithfully interpret this. You know, they're not trying to fuck with you. Um, they're trying to do, but, but they interpret it in a particular way. If you're not happy with that, then you need to change the notation. Like there's that story of some kind of uncoordinated parts, um, open form, like note head notation piece. I don't remember which of the New York school wrote it, but like everybody else finished after like, you know, five or six minutes say, and then Cage played his like three times as slow and was just sitting there plunking away for like 10 or 15 minutes after everybody else. Like, okay, well you, uh, I, I think that you could have stopped. Like what, what are you doing? Um, so thinking like, look, sometimes, maybe sometimes I want to write some stuff that's relatively closed because there are sounds I have this really perfect idea in my head. I really want to hear it. I want to put it out there, but I also want other people to have a space. And ugh, like, sometimes there's a lot of dissonance between those two things and you feel badly like, look, I don't want to tell you exactly what to do. I don't want to impose my thing, but I do really want to hear this. Like, trust me, if you play it like this, it's going to be fantastic. And then when I moved to Canberra, I immediately was in a country you know a, a city a territory a country a continent a hemisphere where i didn't really know anybody which meant that i didn't have access to performers that i knew you know i had a, a concert with some students and faculty pretty early on which was fantastic like having access to i think there were like eight or nine people in that ensemble and we did a multimedia thing and it was super cool but i because I was so isolated from my communities, I started doing more stuff myself. You know, recording, like if, I, if I'm doing a film soundtrack, I'll record the things myself. Um, or, you know, getting more into electronic music and field recordings and things where, you know, if I'm working with another person, there's this space for us to have a... Um, you know, a conversation or for me to create a score that still does these kinds of political things, but that I was kind of forced into a position which actually turned out to be really positive. Just look, if you want to hear that, and that's exactly how you want to hear that, then you should just do it. Like, you should do it yourself. I still make room for myself. Like there's a, a soundtrack uh, that I worked on a few years ago. And I basically, I just looked at how the film had already been cut. So I looked at how long the film was. Um, and I just put a timer on and I tuned my double bass in a particular way. some kind of open like E flat, A flat, thing i don't quite remember and i just improvised for the length of the film i left some gaps in there um but just kind of free improvised for whatever the the duration of the film was there was no dialogue or anything it's just kind of um yeah nice shots and then the next day i tuned my double bass differently i set the timer again and I improvised. And then I just put the two recordings on top of each other and was sort of ready to do some editing, but uh, I did not do any editing. That kind of, yeah, felt, felt good. I mean, and sort of, as somebody who improvises, you sit down and think like that kind of, um, I mean, aesthetic and work conversation that happened um, I'm referencing the 1960s a lot that my PhD was on the New York school so I, that's kind of it's always in there but the idea that like 
you know, Earl Brown or um, Christian Wolf could write something that's kind of open and it's got like three dots on it or like, you know, folio or 25 pages or whatever it is, December 1952, just dots on a page or lines on a page or whatever. And it sounds amazing. And then Boulez or Stockhausen would write something. It took me like nine months to write this thing. It's super delicate and it sounds exactly the same. So like, look, if I can write a basically a piece for two double basses or something that might sound to people who don't recognize a double bass, like a couple of cellos or whatever, because I think the parts were, were quite high at, at some points. Um, and, you know, sometimes I did the sort of Rebecca Saunders crushed detuned low string thing. So you get the, the sub harmonic and all of this stuff. So it, it sounds like this big string thing. And I can get a result that I really like through my improvisational practice. I don't have to sit down and like painstakingly score uh, however many minute long film. Um, the, yeah, I'm trying to bring that that kind of experimentation and openness and improvisation to a lot of different kinds of practices, I guess. There's maybe this kind of a repertoire of um, formats that, especially in the last like six years where I've been working a lot with students um, in Canberra that I've developed that I think work pretty well. I remember in 2014, there was a group of students, there was like a, a chamber music competition and a bunch of the students that I've been working with in kind of experimental music contexts, um, and I looked at the requirements. And for this chamber music con competition, which is you know kind of inherently pretty conservative, um, you know, there's like a prize. So okay, well, we don't people who make the kinds of music that we make don't get like prizes. Um, so yeah, they look, and there's nothing in there to exclude free improvisation. So they entered. Um, and I remember thinking like how much help or like instruction or, um, you know, should I make like a playlist for them so that they can kind of get inside the aesthetic space that free improvisation kind of tends to, you know, like, what what kind of teaching should I do before they just start rehearsing? And I kind of experimented on them. I had no instruction. And I just said, like, look, if you record, you know, it's always important to record your rehearsals, regardless of the kind of music that you're working on, to record it and maybe share the recording with me and we can, you know, kind of talk about it. And it was amazing. Like I had no instruction at all. It was like super sensitive, interesting ensemble playing. There were people who were like matching pitches and they were taking their time and they were working through stuff. It was fantastic. And they just went and I never gave them any instruction and they won the Chamber Music Prize. And occasionally I'll write something Maybe there's like a live soundtrack thing going on or or whatever. It's part of a festival and it's got to be like 45 minutes. Or there was a piece that Charles Martin and I did that was, I think, three hours or six hours. I can't quite remember, but it was a long time. So thinking of ways to provide loose instructions for relatively free improvisation where there's still some kind of some kind of structure, but less in that I want people to be able to perceive a narrative structure or an arc or the changing of harmonies over time, like you know those Elian Rodig synthesis um, synthesizer pieces or improvisations where it's like three or four hours long and she's just changing a couple of parameters 
every once in a while so that you never really hear anything change. But if you fast forward two hours, the sound is completely different and you don't actually know when all of those parameters changed. So there's kind of, here's a set of pitches or textures or instruments or whatever for the first five minutes. And then at around six minutes, player two gradually changes to this set of pitches or gradually moves to this instrument or moves over to whatever. So that it both gives the things some sort of structure and it provides performers with enough um, and also kind of structural unity, you know, like I'm really interested in the harmonic series and creating spaces for play within really um, harmonically consonant um, sets of pitches and um, yeah, those kinds of textures. So lots of open intervals and, and things like that. Um, I think my there's some pieces that I'm where it's exclusively fourths and sixths, basically. Like I kind of have some intervals that I uh, prefer, but that they have this sort of set of pitches or textures or whatever, and they have some time to experiment with it. Enough time so that they can kind of get bored and try new things. You know, there's that kind of attention graph where you're really interested and then you get bored. And then there's that bit after that, the kind of cagey and thing where if I only give you three pitches and I give you 10 minutes, you're going to get through all of your hot licks in the first 45 seconds, then you're going to get bored and then the good stuff's going to happen. So making sure that each section is long enough to get that. So it, originally, when I started studying Scottish music, um, which I guess started when I was an undergraduate, I mean, I'm ethnically half um, German and Alsatian on my mother's side, and then half Scottish on my father's side. Um, the surname Hunter is um, a translation um, of either Ifiachra from Irish or Machichelagith um, from Scottish Gaelic, which is the son of the hunter. Um, and they come from a little island um, in between Ireland and Scotland called Arran. Um, and yeah, I kind of got into that, that music and did my ethnomusicology studies, um, started learning the language. Um, no one in my family speaks it, um, although my mother's family speak German. Um, so I lived on this island and it originally was, you know, the kinds of singing practice that I was learning and learning tunes. And I started playing whistle and I played the pipes a little bit, kind of really terribly. And I don't have a set, um, cause the upkeep of pipes is kind of a, a full-time job, um, and mandolin and all these, these other things that it, it was originally a separate practice. And then the start of my PhD was trying to figure out how to combine the two because historically the kinds of Gaelic music that made it into classical music was you know people would go up to the islands they'd ask some old person to sing a song they'd kind of write it down with you know grand staff notation try to harmonize it in whatever the style happened to be at the time sell some manuscripts in London and then we have this kind of idea of what you know Scottish airs or Irish airs or whatever are and you know there's kind of pub songs and all of that all of that tradition um, but what I got more interested in is the traditions that um, I mean I yeah played a lot of all all of these different kinds of of musics but the the kinds that I started gravitating more towards especially because I was living on an island where people had particularly like there's um 
an ethnomusicologist um, called Margaret Fay Shaw, who lived on South U.S. for a long time. And I studied with some of the people that she'd collected songs from. And this trying to get to traditions that um, hadn't been kind of, you know, round peg, square hole, or whether it's a square peg and a round or whatever, um, like forced into equally tempered, you know, functional diatonic harmony. You know, you you think about Irish songs. Okay, well, it's kind of telling a story or whatever. Like, or there's like a murder ballads from England and from the south of Scotland and all of these things where it's there's a narrative. And a lot of Scottish poetry in Gaelic doesn't have a narrative structure. It's kind of exploring one particular idea from lots of different angles, which fit exactly with the ideas of time and kind of these um, temporal concepts that come from the writings of Jonathan D. Kramer, the musicologist I was studying a lot at the time, you know, Morton Feldman's string quartets are like seven hours and he's basically like just rearranging the furniture in a room or looking at a sculpture from different angles. And there's, there's a really limited amount of material, but you're just exploring it, you know, holding it in your hand and seeing how the light hits it. And these ideas of, you know, like the Scottish pipes, Unlike the, the Irish pipes, Illin pipes, which can play chords and they can play harmonies and they can also stop, that there's this idea that where I've only got these pitches, I've only got nine pitches. They're only these intervals. They're not e they're not equally tempered intervals. They're pure intervals, and that the music is linear rather than being this thing that a lot of um, musics have had to integrate with with the kind of vertical classical music homophonic structure where there's like a melody and there's some chords okay well in this in these kinds of musics that i was starting to engage with that doesn't exist like it's a linear practice or even scottish psalm singing which is like the most amazing collective improvisation there people are collectively improvising melodies over psalms and if you haven't heard those recordings, they're amazing. There's a couple of albums called Psalm, um, S-A-L-M, uh, which are fantastic. A lot of YouTube videos and, and things like that. Um, but this idea that in, and it even it bleeds into pub music as well, not pub songs necessarily, but like jigs and reels and marches and strut spays and reels. And I think I said reels twice. But the idea that like when you're accompanying uh, well, there's light music and there's classical music, right? In lots of different traditions. In Indian music, which I also studied, um, I played sitar for three years, there's light music and there's classical music. And we have, you know, functional music, like dance music, and then we have music that you sit and listen to. You know, there's like Tommy Dorsey big band music, which is for dancing, and then there's like, you know, Maria Schneider. Nobody, you're not meant to dance to Maria Schneider, really. I guess you could. Um, but this idea that there's classical, like Scottish classical music, we have Piperoch, which is this huge tradition of increasingly uh, intricate ornamentation on a, on a fundamental melody. And you can have grace notes that are in groups of like 13. So I have this melody and in between each of them, I have these different combinations of somewhere between one and 10 or 12 or whatever grace notes. It's amazingly complex. And it's classical music. It's designed to, you sit there and you listen to this thing and you appreciate, you know, in the same way that one of the best compliments in Gaelic culture is that you have good Gaelic, right? Your articulation is good. People compliment your vowel sounds and the, the, the complexity and the depth of the word play and all of this. It's a very, um, they're very aware of the language that's being used. But this, the idea that, I mean, the Scottish classical music is way different from any of the traditions that we have uh, inherited through this kind of canonical Western thing. 
you know, lots of complexities elsewhere in Europe as well, Italian, different Italian musics and bagpipes and all of this stuff. But that even in the light music, so stuff that like this is in D major and this is in 6 8, that the, the performance practice for Irish and Scottish dance music is light music, jigs, reels, whatever, is that the melody is the constant. Like this is the melody, you know, I learned this tune from whoever, maybe I'll ornament it differently, whatever, but I'm, the melody is there. And that because the melodies were often written without a harmonic context in mind, the harmonic context, the chords that somebody playing the guitar or bazooki or sitern or piano or whatever are playing, and the kinds of accompaniment textures that they're using are constantly, at least initially, improvised. I guess one other thing would be um, the kind of influence of not only your academic education and process of playing and, and composing and all that kind of stuff, but the influence of the, the contemporaries, uh, of your contemporaries, I guess, um, in the kind of art, well, not even just the art music space, obviously, when you're in... Um, when you're a modern composer, you kind of want to be looking as far as you can. I think there's a a tendency, which I hope in my own um, teaching I'm not passing on, um, to think that there are these kinds of great composers and the majority of them are either quite old and did all of their really interesting stuff a while ago, or they're quite dead. Um, and, you know, with some exceptions, most of the composers and most of the musicians that I studied when I was an undergraduate were really dead. Like I transcribed so many Paul Chambers bass lines, and I studied so many John Cage scores. And we did overlap for a little bit, but I think he died when I was six, so I, we didn't hang out even though he did used to teach where I, where I studied. Um, but then I, it's so, there's so much potential for that to not be some, not be a way that uh, contemporary composers feel. I remember, um, going to, and it's, I know that Darmstadt is a thing and it's always sort of been this way, but I remember my first time at Darmstadt, um, seeing all of these um but it was a it kind of a thing happened and this was uh 2016 i think that there were all the like old like i mean canonical in, in our context like lachenmann um yeah, you know like old german dudes who are like super intense and like really hardcore high modernist like holy shit i just i want to listen to everything you have to say because it's all fantastic and i might understand some of it and then there were there's this other group of composers who are people that are like actually engaging with communities and with with contemporary ideas and not living in their own little modernist heads and you know there people put on their own concerts and they engage with each other and that like i hung out with georgie Bourne for like two days and it was amazing i think like you are such an interesting and famous person and like you know we're just sort of hanging out and getting a coffee and talking about random things and i think that the the connections between composers and the sharing of ideas um, that we, not to be one of those people who, who 
starts talking about like how amazing social media is and whatever. But I, I do think that it feels to me like in 20 years, when I look back at this decade, it will look like there was a lot more um, music being made and a lot more diversity in the kinds of um, composers that people, um, whose music people had access to. Um, I think maybe one of the, the last things I like to do is just ask, um, what, what, are, what are you listening to at the moment and what, what's, um, what's exciting for you at the moment? I, every once in a while, I, um, I was going to say I have to, but I, I have the opportunity to, and I'm, I'm asked to teach first year oral skills, um, and I had a, a pretty conservative oral skills training. Um, but I think that one of the best things that um, that I can do in that context is to every year that I teach that course, completely um, redo all of the repertoire that we look at. So I try for the, for maybe like a month or two before I start teaching that course to create just heaps of probably like unhealthily large Spotify playlists of music that I'm just not aware of because it like, you know, they can't just listen to Mingus. It's that we have to get out of that. So I'm been listening to a lot of new music um, that is outside of my kind of previous aesthetic preferences or stuff that I would listen to if I wasn't, if I didn't have a kind of goal of presenting an oral skills curriculum with a really wide range and of um, music by a, a diverse group of people. So um, one of the places that I always go back to is the Milk Records mixtape Spotify playlist. Um, yeah, it's up updated i think maybe kind of once a month ish but it's um yeah i always when that comes out i put on the the milk records mixtape and kind of let that present me with different kinds of rabbit holes where you know okay i really like that person let me check out all of their other records and then maybe recommended artists there or you kind of check out people that they collaborate with um but I think, yeah, it, it gives me an opportunity to get out of my own space. And I try to listen to, try to listen to something new every day. Having a dog who needs to be walked is a really good way to build some space for that.
just heard Gungarland to Mount Ainsley from the Sounding Canberra album. You also heard snippets of Side A by Andromeda is Coming, as well as a piece performed by the Canberra Youth Orchestra composed by Alec Hunter. You can find more information on Alec's work on our website, cassetteconnection.com. Ben, thoughts, comments? Yeah, I thought it was a, um, a great conversation. Uh, it's really good. Alec was, I have to be honest and say that Alec was my um, composition lecturer while I was at uni. So it is um, actually great to be able to hear a bit more of his history. Um, I was unaware that he moved to an island. Yeah, totally. What a, what a crazy... I know. What a journey. Mm. Halfway around the world um, and then decided to pick up Gaelic. But I, I, I did know about the, the Scottish music and the, um, the Gaelic uh, and that kind of stuff. I thought that is something I actually really wanted to touch on because... I don't think it's really um, talked about all that much here. Mm. Uh, obviously, in the UK and in Ireland, there's a big tradition of, of that kind of thing. Um, but has it made its way to Canberra? I'm not too sure. No. no. But it was a great conversation. I want to thank Alec for being on the show. Um, and thank you for listening. Farewell. Bye. Cassette Connection is recorded and produced by Ben Harp and Alex Ferugia. For more information, head to our website, cassetteconnection.com. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Cassette Connection. And if you would like to be featured or just want to get in touch, our email is contact at cassetteconnection.com.